before this example, we're probing the gravity field here. We're probing the gravity field of Europa. And through that gravity field determination, we can detect and confirm that ocean underneath the ice. Unfortunately, to get that data, we either have to point this high gain antenna at Earth or deploy uh, medium gain antennas on this and other facets of the spacecraft and point that vehicle to Earth to get it. And what that means is all of these instruments that are oriented towards Europa get pointed away. That's not good. So what DSAT could do is we could take advantage of the fact that on board every spacecraft are these little low gain antennas. And what's nifty about low gain antennas is they have, they have a, a large view of, of, of space around them. These antennas, these high gain antennas, have a very narrow view. So we take those low gain antennas, and you remember that DSN antenna that was big with all that power transmitting? We can actually track those signals with low gain antennas on board a vehicle that's at Europa. If you add DSAC to that mix, now that data that we're collecting is accurate, accurate enough to determine the gravity field. And in fact, if DSAC were to be on board this vehicle, we'd deliver about three times more data than we would get using, let's say, for instance, this high gain antenna. Other missions that NASA is contemplating is sending balloons to Titan. Titan has an atmosphere of nitrogen. We speculate that there, is, there are seas of methane. Um, it's a very um, oceany world. Um, and one of the ways in which we can explore it is set a balloon afloat in the atmosphere and let it drift. But one of the things we, would be, that would be difficult is to track where that balloon is at as it's coursing over, over Titan. If you had a very small version of DSAC, took advantage of that DSN transmitting that high power to this vehicle. In fact, you'd probably have to array four 34 meter antennas to get enough power up there. You could actually track this balloon as it's flying over Titan and chart its course. And so now you could correlate that course with all the science data that the balloon is collecting and transmitting back to Earth. So those are nifty science applications. Let's get back to navigation. And I'm going to look at Mars. Um, one of the next missions that we're envisioning going to Mars is, a, is an orbiter in 2022. Um, and one of the ways in which we're hoping or planning right now is to insert into a low Martian orbit using solar electric propulsion. Solar electric propulsion provide, or imparts a small acceleration, and the spacecraft will slowly spiral into a low Martian orbit. Navigation-wise, it's a pretty intense period of time. It takes a long time. If you had DSAC on board, you could take advantage of the ability to get all that data without impacting other missions that need that data at the same time. And you could collect it and process it and improve our ability to do navigation. Another way in which DSAC um, could be helpful is thinking forward to humans going to Mars. There's going to be probably an armada of vehicles going to Mars. If you had DSAC on board and you had uplink transmissions to those spacecraft and you coupled DSAC with onboard computers, you could compute your trajectory in real time that the astronauts could use to um, safely and robustly um, make their way to Mars, either in orbit or land. So those are some of the applications we're envisioning. Um, I hope you liked our talk today. And I thought I'd end with just a few pictures here illustrating clocks over the past quarter millennium and numerically the improving stability that we see with each of those. So there is Harrison's H4 watch at a tenth of a second per day. And then came along USOs about in the 1960s. And they're 10,000 times more stable at this microsecond per day. And now we have DSAC at about 3 tenths of a nanosecond per day and 3,000 times more stable than that. Thank you for your attention. And we're happy to answer any questions you all might have. Anybody has any questions, come down to the mics. Oh, we did too good of a job explaining everything. It's crystal clear. Uh, Don't be shy. Oh, here's one. 
Um, I have a question. So the most accurate clock in the whole world, um, you said a little bit about how you can try and measure the accuracy of very accurate clocks using this constellation of GPS satellites. How is the error in the most accurate clock in the world measured? It's a voting scheme. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, you, you, it's more accurate than any other clock. It's not more accurate than a bunch of clocks together. Okay. And so mathematically, you can combine the accuracy of what's called an ensemble of clocks and compare it against that. It's very similar to what we're doing with, with DSAC on orbit. Yeah. <clears throat> Oh, we have a. I've got a question. Oh, what limits the lifetime of this clock? And how long a lifetime does it have? Because it has to go to deep space and last for years. So, um... I'll let Alan answer that I'm one. I'm sorry. What so, was. So, so, what limits the lifetime of this clock? And how do you know it's going to work for many years to get to the outer solar system? Right. So the limitation for most space-faring uh, equipment are the electronics and the fact that it's, it's alternately either very cold and very hot or it's just very cold all the time or as the spacecraft heats up it gets cold and then hot and that makes all the electronic boards the same, the same way the electronics in your car go out. They span and contract and eventually something breaks. So that's, that's the fundamental limit to the lifetime of the clock. We have uh, tubes, like those little ion trap tubes, they're sealed, and we have some that have lasted uh, well over five years. Uh, well, gosh, I guess it's nine years now because it was five when we started this project. Um, and so we don't see, you know, we can make a seal that lasts a, a long, long time. And the uh, mercury atoms and the, and the things inside of the tube don't actually go away, so um, it's really just the electronics. Okay, so my question, uh, the one-way tracking that you can do with the, with the accurate uh, atomic talk, clock, uh, you, you're only getting radial information. Uh, you, you know, you're, only, you're only getting very accurate, but line it's... Line of sight information. Line, line of sight information. Uh, would, is it at some point in the future, could you, like, have a second master station at maybe Mars or something, and then you could get ranging from two different directions. You could, and in fact... Wouldn't that be better? Uh, one of the concepts for humans going to Mars is to put a Mars aerial stationary satellite, and that would provide tracking services while at Mars for the astronauts on the surface, as well as approaching vehicles. And so in that little cartoon I showed actually two arrows going to that little rocket, and that was demonstrating that, that very possibility. Another thing, which we've actually done quite a bit of, um, JPL is famous for doing optical navigation. We take cameras, we take images of celestial bodies with a star background, and over time, you can figure out your location relative to those bodies. You could couple that process, which is called plane of sky information, because it's angular information, with the line of sight information that uh, the ranging provides, and now you have a more complete kind of three-dimensional fix of your location in space. So that's another possibility that we could, that, that we're envisioning. Thank you. Okay, we have some, uh, I guess these are social media questions. <laughs> I've been handed. Um, so the first one is, is for Todd. <laughs> okay. What are the effects of general relativity on atomic clocks in outer space far from Earth's gravitational field? Okay, so the GPS system actually has to deal with this. They actually, uh, the frequency that it would naturally transmit in its orbit, they actually artificially reduce that frequency because the clocks on Earth tick at a different rate than the clocks in the GPS constellation. And so this is, this is a fact of life. This is something we have to deal with. We have to deal with it today routinely, even with two-way data, and so using DSAC, in the future with one-way data, we would have to correct for general relativistic effects. They're small, but they're substantial. And if we didn't correct for them, they would be the largest error source that we would encounter in going to places like Mars and Jupiter. 
So do clocks click tick faster or slower on Mars than they do they here? They click faster at Mars because okay. it's a smaller gravity well than at okay. Earth. It's an inside joke. We spent 10 minutes this afternoon trying to figure out the answer to that question in case someone <laughs> asks it. Your head can get dizzy thinking about the sines, minus, plus. <laughs> if you don't get it right, you get it wrong. Okay, I have another uh, question from the uh, cybersphere. Since DSAC operates at the level of atoms, are there any challenges because of quantum mechanics? Um, well, actually, we use quantum mechanical effects. That's exactly how the, this, this wiggling I was talking about with this electron is actually a quantum mechanical effect. Um, but one of the uh, reasons we trap the ions in a field is to reduce any perturbations on the atoms but we don't get to the level of quantum mechanical effects uh, in, in that. So um, the challenges are to design a very magnetically clean clock. That whole clock, all that metal, none of it is magnetic. So it's all non-magnetic metals. And those magnetic fields, those stray magnetic fields, would induce a quantum mechanical effect. So that's a challenge because non-magnetic screws are hard to find. Actually, to follow up on that, we talk about the harsh environment of space, and people's perceptions might be the space around the vehicle, but really the space inside the vehicle is an environment we have to deal with. The changing temperatures inside the spacecraft, the magnetic fields from the outer environment, as well as the magnetic fields from the spacecraft itself could impact the stability of the clock, and so we have to deal with that. Okay, I have another question here. Could nearby spacecraft use a DSAC that is close by? So um, what DSAC does, and we didn't really get into this, is it takes a USO and it uses that tuning fork feature that Alan talked about. And we control the output of a USO to get a more stable frequency on longer time scales. So in 10 seconds, we're really adopting the stability of the USO that is part of this process. And in fact, USOs are used routinely for communicating between nearby spacecraft. An example that we used at Earth and at the moon, at Earth is the GRACE mission. They use uh, communication links between two spacecraft that are in orbit. There are a few hundred kilometers apart. And the time for that signal to, to go back and forth is very short. And so over those periods of time, it's a USO that's dominant. DSAC probably wouldn't be a huge help for that process. What really matters for DSAC is looking at the evolution of the frequency and time over long periods of time. So you're taking measurements at a, a period of time, and then you're not taking measurements for a day, and you start taking them again. You don't want your frequency and time source to have drifted significantly away from what it's supposed to be, because that becomes an error that you have to deal with in this trajectory determination process. And you remember, we have only a limited amount of data to figure out that trajectory. So errors like clocks make that harder. OK, this one's from a Ustream chat. So we got you covered, Ustream. Could an Earth orbiting DSAC augment the deep space network for navigating existing probes and missions? So the challenge there is, you know, the one answer would be yes. But actually, the real challenge for an orbiting spacecraft is knowing its location precisely. So for this DSN enterprise to work, we actually do um, uh, location of the of monuments that define the antenna face center to within a centimeter you know, of where that signal will enter that antenna. We know that in inertial space in an absolute way to within a centimeter. We'd be challenged for, say, a geostationary spacecraft with DSAC to have that kind of accuracy. So while the frequency and time stability on the satellite would be good, and could augment the DSN, we'd be challenged knowing where that spacecraft is at to participate in this navigation enterprise. So from the sound of things, there's kind of a log jam or a traffic jam at bottleneck at the uh, Deep Space Network. Uh, can you comment about any plans to expand the DSN to, because Unless the current missions are basically going to die out in the next few years, um, with the number of missions that will be coming online, we're going to be needing more DSN capability. Yeah, That's there's true. currently five missions at Mars right now, right? Is it just five? 